Hare Krishna devotees, welcome to the conclusion of chapter 4 today. The last weekend we looked at several shlokas beginning with uh, two metaphors, the metaphor of the boat that helps you <clears throat> cross over the ocean of misery. The boat is available to all sinners, no matter how uh, horrible a sinner that you may consider yourself to be. Um, this boat is the boat of transcendental knowledge. And if we get aboard this boat, uh, with the captain of the boat being the spiritual master, you can easily cross over this ocean of misery. And then <clears throat> the other analogy that we looked at was that um, firewood being burned to ashes. So this transcendental knowledge is compared to a blazing fire and through this process of acquiring knowledge, this transcendental knowledge, our reactions to material activities also dissipate. And in that context, we talked about the process of karma. One of the things that I forgot to mention is that the difference between Jnana Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. Just acquiring <clears throat> this transcendental knowledge burns up all your aprarabdha karma. Aprarabdha karma. Just getting this transcendental knowledge. But along with the transcendental knowledge, if you practice bhakti, it's only bhakti that can burn your prarabdha karma. So it's the two broad categories of karma. A prarabdha karma means the karma phala that is not yet fructified. Prarabdha karma means the karma phala that is fructified and that you are experiencing in this life. So the difference between jnana and bhakti is jnana burns away your aprarabdha karma. Bhakti burns away both. Aprarabdha karma as well as your prarabdha karma. And we also discussed that ultimately ignorance is the root cause of our sufferings. Because of our avidya uh, We develop these material desires and then actually inclinations first, which then get converted into desires and then converted into actions and then that gets converted into papa or punya. And our avidya stems from the fact that we are actually separated from the Lord. And we get separated from the Lord, then essentially you're dancing with Maya Devi. And uh, that can be a difficult dance. So essentially, ignorance is the root cause of all of our suffering. And <clears throat> performing all these Vedic rituals that the Lord has talked about, which we will cover in our summary slide today, definitely gives you relief from sinful reactions. But the problem is, it does not destroy your sinful proclivity, which means the roots are still there. But by performing these Vedic rituals, the weed is cut down. But the weed is likely to grow given the appropriate conditions of some amount of rain or moisture in the air or in the ground. So there is always a risk that when you perform Vedic rituals, um, the sinful activities may be burnt away, but 
the chances of you doing more and more activities that could cause you to experience sin remains. So the deweeding process has to include a complete uprooting of your material desires. And that can only happen through bhakti. Yeah. So essentially, the reason that we are suffering is because of our separation from Krishna. And then the Lord glorifies transcendental knowledge itself as being sublime, as being pure, as being the ripe fruit of the mystics who practice one of the transcendental paths. And the Lord says, over due course of time, after practicing all of these transcendental paths, you'll come to the path of devotional service and um, you will enjoy this knowledge within yourself. And then the Lord talked about those who are faithful. So faith is an essential component of practicing any one of the transcendental paths. That one must have faith. If you don't have faith, nothing is going to work out for you. So once you have faith in this transcendental knowledge, the Lord says you can subdue your senses. And having achieved this knowledge, you will get the supreme spiritual peace. So essentially, faith is like the key to access transcendental knowledge. Shraddha. But Shraddha plus action in the form of bhakti or devotional service, which has to be performed in humility, will actually get you Krishna Prema. So without faith, nothing can help you. Uh, not, on, not, not just in this life, but in any life. And then in the 40th shloka, the Lord contrasts the faithful to the not so faithful, which he calls them uh, <clears throat> the ignorant. Agnya. So the ignorant and faithless people, the Lord says, because they doubt the revealed scriptures. If you doubt the revealed scriptures, then, they are, then you're also doubting God. So the Lord says they cannot achieve God consciousness. Rather, they go in the opposite direction. They fall down. And then the Lord says for the doubting soul, there is happiness neither in this world nor in the next because they doubt everything so much. Uh, we, we talked about the difference between samshaya and prashna. Prashna is a question and samshaya is a doubt. So if you suspect everything, then there is no value to life at all. Right? If you're suspicious of people, if you're suspicious of things, if you're suspicious of knowledge, um, really that must be a pretty... Uh, frustrating life to lead. So doubting scriptures can only lead to despair. Healthy skepticism is necessary, but cynicism can rob us of our faith and ultimately robs you of hope as well. Therefore, it's better for us to simply um, trust Krishna, have faith in Krishna. In that context, in the context of faith plus transcendental knowledge, we talked about three kinds of sadhakas, the Uttama Adhikari, the Madhyama Adhikari, and then the Kanishta Adhikari. The Uttama Adhikari is, their faith is strong, and also their knowledge is topmost because they are self-realized souls, essentially. So Srila Prabhupada would be considered an Uttama Adhikari. The Madhyama Adhikari have firm faith, but their knowledge is a little bit shaky. So if they associate with the wrong people who may think that they are well-versed in scriptures, but they may lead them down the wrong path, they can easily be taken in a different direction. So the key for a Madhyama Adhikari is to maintain association of Vaishnavas. 
If one doesn't maintain association of Vaishnavas, then you'll drop from Madhyama Adhikari to probably not even Kanishta Adhikari, probably become a non-devotee. There are many, many examples, not just in scriptures, but also in our current Krishna conscious uh, days, along with examples from Srila Prabhupada's days, where the minute a devotee stopped association with Vaishnavas, they lost contact with Krishna consciousness altogether. That can happen very, very quickly. As a matter of fact, today when I was in the temple, I was talking to one of the uh, young Vaishnavis and um, I was just generally asking her, um, you know, um, she was telling me about her brother, uh, her brother being in the U.S., got married recently and I was asking is her brother also Krishna, is, is he a practicing devotee? Like she told me her parents are not practicing devotees. <clears throat> she said he was a practicing devotee. And I asked what happened. And uh, she said there was some, um, what her brother felt was unwarranted criticism from family members who were also practicing devotees that disgusted him so much, he just left and he never came back. So just the wrong word that you think you heard from the lips of another devotee, or you stop association, then pretty soon you're in a very, uh, you know, unstable ground. So for a Madhyama Dikari, it is very, very important to maintain contact with Vaishnavas. Because if you don't maintain contact with Vaishnavas, uh, well, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough road for that person. They may never ever come back to the path of bhakti. So Vaishnava association plays such a critical role. On the other hand, the Kanishta Adhikari, uh, the neophyte, the person who may be relatively new, their, their faith is shaky as, and their knowledge is not on firm ground. So, you know, most of us practicing devotees would consider ourselves to be probably being close to a Madhyama Adhikari. But the risk is if we stop association, if we stop coming to the temple, if we stop having physical uh, association with other devotees, then it becomes very hard to sustain your bhakti. So that is why this bhakti lata bij is called a creeper. It is not a tree, it is not a it's, it, it doesn't stand on its own. A creeper needs a support system, right? To grow. So this bhakti creeper is completely dependent on the mercy of the other Vaishnavas and completely dependent on the, on the association, good association of Vaishnavas. Without that, the creeper is just cannot be strong. So the creeper depends on that. So today we will cover the last two shlokas of chapter four. And then we'll look at the summary of chapter four, a summary view of chapter four. So I'll recite the shlokas. Y'all can stay on mute. <clears throat> So shloka number 41. Yoga sanyasta karmanam jnana sanchinna samshayam atma vantam na karmani nibhadnanti dhananjaya yoga sanyasta karmanam jnana sanchinna samshayam Atma vantam na karmani 
निभन्नन्ति धनञ्जय योग संयस्त कर्माणम ज्ञान संचिन्न संशयम आत्मवंतम न कर्माणि निभन्नन्ति धनञ्जय what forward meaning and translation by his divine grace ac bhakti vedanta swami shila prabhupad shila prabhupad ki jai yoga by devotional service in karma yoga samyasta one who has renounced karmanam the fruits of actions gnana by knowledge sanchinna cut samshayam doubts atmavantam situated in the self na never karmani works nibhadnanti do bind dhanam jaya o conqueror of riches translation one who acts in devotional service renouncing the fruits of his actions and whose doubts have been destroyed by transcendental knowledge is situated factually in the self thus he is not bound by the reactions of work o conqueror of riches so let's look at this particular shloka so it's clear that in this particular shloka the lord is saying when you obtain transcendental knowledge your doubts relating to the spiritual world to your stat- status as a jivatma to the lord's status as the paramatma all of these things will be destroyed so that means one has to listen hear study the scriptures every day only then your doubts have an opportunity to be resolved so prabhupad writes that if we follow the instructions given by lord krishna himself in the bhagavad gita we become free from doubts by the grace of transcendental knowledge so the lord will reveal things to you as you become more and more of a serious sadhaka so some of this is uh, through acquisition of knowledge but most of it is through realizations and perhaps revelations by the lord himself so such a transcendentalist who is part and parcel of the lord is established in self knowledge so the lord uses the word yoga sanyasta karmanam so if you look at the word yoga that means to unite with the lord karma means all of your actions and activities related to your prescribed duties as per the scriptures so sanyas means to renounce so what's the lord actually saying yoga sanyasta karmanam so the lord is saying that those who have renounced their prescribed duties which is the aspects of performing some rituals and performing your duties as per varnashram and they simply dedicate their body mind and soul to the lord they are actually serving the lord with every action they undertake yoga sanyasta karmanam now does that mean they don't act they do act it's just that their vision is that all of their activities must be dovetailed in krishna consciousness so hence the lord is saying this yoga sanyasta karmanam they are actually not bound by their actions even though they are also acting just like you and me they are also performing activities they are performing their prescribed duties but they are beyond the realms of karmic reactions hence the lord is saying such a person is not bound by their actions because they are actually working in devotion they are not working for themselves and we mentioned last time 
that any number multiplied by zero will always be zero. So as long as you're on that boat and you're connected to that fire, no matter how abominable your activities may be, how sinful your activities may be, you are not touched by karmic reactions. So zero multiplied by any number will always be zero. That means the actions of an enlightened soul really do not bind them. Although externally to you and me, it may seem that they are also performing mundane activities, but they are not. They are actually on the transcendental platform. So such an enlightened soul, they're called enlightened because they know what the truth is. They've realized it. They know that any work that is performed for the pleasure of the Lord will not bind them. How do they know this? Because of their connection with transcendental knowledge, all of their doubts have been destroyed. So whenever Krishna says, if you work for me, there's no karmic reactions, they accept it because they know that's the truth. So in the next verse, which is the final verse in this chapter, the Lord is actually going to request Arjuna to act on the basis of his conviction that what he's doing is right, what he's doing is dharmic, and he should do everything to actually please Lord Krishna. So let's look at the last shloka. Tasmadagnana sambhutam Kritstam jnana shinatmana Chitvainam samshayam yogam Atishto tishta bharata Tasmadagnana sambhutam Kritstam jnana shinatmana Chitvainam samshayam yogam Atishto tishta bharata Tasma dagnana sambhutam Kritstam jnana sinatmana Chitvainam samshayam yogam Atishto tishta bharata Word for word meaning and translation by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Tasmat, therefore, Agnana Sambhutam, born of ignorance, Khritstham, situated in the heart, Gnana of knowledge, Asina, by the weapon, Atmanaha, of the self. Chitva, cutting off. Enam, this. Samshayam, doubt. Yogam, in yoga. Atishtha, be situated. Uttishtha, stand up to fight. Bharata, or descendant of Bharata. Translation, therefore the doubts which have arisen in your heart out of ignorance, should be slashed by the weapon of knowledge. Armed with yoga, O Bharata, stand and fight. So there's a clear-cut instruction from Krishna what Arjuna should do. Arjuna should fight. But fight whom? The warriors on the battlefield? Or his own doubts? that has crept into his mind. So let's look a little deeper into this particular shloka. So <clears throat> again, doubts are slashed by the weapon of knowledge. Some interesting terms that the Lord uses here. So the Lord uses the word khritstham, and Prabhupada translates this as situated in the heart. And similar to what we were covering in chapter 8, here also, the heart does not refer to the physical heart. So the Vedas state that one's physical brain, physically, the brain resides in the head. 
but the mind doesn't reside in the head. The subtle mind resides in the heart region. So when the Lord is using the word khrit or hridaya, heart, he's not referencing the physical heart, he's actually referencing the mind. This you will see throughout the Bhagavad Gita. So Krishna is asking Arjuna to dispel the doubts that have arisen in his heart, that have arisen in his mind. As the spiritual master, the Lord has instructed his disciple on how to gain wisdom from the practice of karma yoga, which is what this entire chapter was about, but situated in transcendental knowledge. Using his wisdom and his faith. So faith plus transcendental knowledge plus, well, faith plus transcendental knowledge can remove the doubts. So Arjuna should slash the doubts from his mind. The Lord then asks Arjuna to stand and fight armed with yoga or transcendental knowledge. Okay, so asking Arjuna to fight makes sense. Obviously, they are on the battlefield. Asking Arjuna to fight with a sword does not make sense. The Lord uses the word chitva, cutting off. Arjuna is not uh, proficient in sword fighting. He is a celebrated archer. So why is the Lord using the word sword instead of bow and arrow? So that's the first uh, aspect of how do we understand the Lord is using the word cut. What is not expected is that Lord Krishna has asked Arjuna to fight with the metaphorical sword, the sword of knowledge. What is even more unexpected is that the Lord is asking Arjuna to fight the inner battle first, to destroy his inner doubts, not the outer enemies. So now the Lord has said, slash your internal doubts and misgivings, stand up and fight. So by urging Arjuna to fight with the sword of knowledge, Krishna has essentially deepened Arjuna's vision of the war. The war is not just about killing the people on the other side. The war is far beyond the construct of a physical battle. The war is also about understanding who Arjuna really is. That's the inner war. It begins with a mistaken sense of identity. And therefore, Arjuna now knows that he is the soul, that the Lord is the super soul, and that should have broadened his vision. What is his role in life? Is to serve the Lord. And if Krishna is saying, get up and fight, stand up and fight, then Krishna has expressed his desire very clearly to Arjuna. So all Arjuna has to do is simply follow the instructions. But to follow the instructions, his doubts his inner doubts about, oh, so much sin. Oh, I have compassion. Oh, social community, fabric, everything will get destroyed. All those inner doubts should have vanished based on what Arjuna has heard so far. So what has Krishna done? He has broadened the vision of Arjuna to not just look at this narrowly as a fight between him and his grandfather and guru on the other side. He has to take a much broader view of the situation. In order to take that broader view, he first has to understand who he is. And then, of course, who is the Supreme Lord? That's the whole topic of this chapter, is transcendental knowledge. Understanding who is the soul, understanding the position of the super soul. So this sword of knowledge helps you arise from a platform of ambiguity. Ambiguity means filled with doubts, you really don't know what is the right answer in a difficult situation, to the platform of absolute clarity. So Arjuna had all kinds of doubts, 
in the first chapter and in the first few shlokas of the second chapter. By hearing this transcendental knowledge, Arjuna's doubt should have vanished. That's not the case. Chapter 5 begins with the same question that chapter 3 began. So Prabhupada, in his purport, he summarizes this entire chapter very beautifully. If you have time, read the purport to, uh, to shloka number 42. It can be a little difficult to understand. But I've just picked a few um, aspects of the purport that Prabhupada has written. No, I've not put the entire purport here. So Prabhupada writes that this yoga system instructed in this chapter is called Sanatana Yoga. Sanatana means eternal or eternal activities, which means our only eternal activity is that we are servants of Krishna. That's the eternal activity that we have. That's our fundamental foremost duty on the spiritual platform. Then Prabhupada writes, this yoga has two divisions of sacrificial actions. One is called sacrifice of one's material possessions. So by slowly sacrificing the results of what you have worked or your possessions itself, you will come to the platform of transcendental knowledge. The other path is to come directly on the knowledge of the self, which is a pure spiritual activity. And two beautiful sentences that Prabhupada writes in the purport. If sacrifice of one's material possessions is not dovetail for spiritual realization, then such a sacrifice becomes material. Which means, so let us say I perform some ritual because I want something in return. But I am not performing that ritual for me to elevate my consciousness. Then that sacrifice is still very much on the material platform. It is not on the spiritual platform. Which means there is papa and or punya involved depending on whether you followed the Vedic scriptures or not as part of that sacrifice. And in the next sentence, Prabhupada writes, but one who performs such sacrifices with a spiritual objective or in devotional service makes a perfect sacrifice. That sacrifice uh, does not bind you to the material world. So when we come to spiritual activities, we find that these are also divided into two. So the material activities are, one is the sacrifice of possessions, the other is uh, getting knowledge of self. And now to the spiritual activities. When we come to spiritual activities, we find that these are also divided into two, namely understanding of one's own self or one's constitutional position and the truth regarding the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, as the Lord has already explained, the transcendental knowledge is the science of the self and the super soul and the relationship between the two. So, this is considered pure spiritual activity. It is not considered a material activity. So, His Grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu uh, uses a very nice sentence to summarize this entire um, shloka and specifically this chapter. So what is the point of having a sword in one's hand? If we are being attacked, we cannot defend ourselves. What is the point of having a sword in hand when we see somebody else being attacked and we are not willing to defend them? So don't let the sword of knowledge fall asleep in your arms, which means we are reading the Bhagavad Gita, we are hearing this knowledge, we are attending classes, but we are not applying anything that we learn in our day-to-day -day practice. So that's like the sword of knowledge has fallen asleep in your arms. So hearing, which is not supported by actual application of the learnings of the Bhagavad Gita, 
is like having a sword in your hand, but your arm has fallen asleep and does not know how to use that sword. So the most important thing is that you have given, you've been given the sword of knowledge. You have to learn how to use it to defeat illusion, to defeat uh, Maya Devi. So unless we actually apply it in our daily life and defeat illusion, that sword is useless. Similarly, let us say you have used the sword of knowledge to rectify your life and to put yourself on the correct path. Now you see others suffering because of their lack of transcendental knowledge. They are being attacked by Maya Devi. You have a sword in your hand, but you're not doing anything to defend them. You're not doing anything to protect them. Then again, that sword is asleep in your hands. So outreach to others who are also being attacked by illusion, which means sharing this sword of wisdom with others is also one of our responsibilities. One is to learn this knowledge ourselves and apply it and have this realizations. Two is to help others come on the path. So don't let the sword of knowledge fall asleep in your arms. We have to use it to defeat Maya Devi. And we have to use it to help others also defeat Maya Devi. So we have to learn how to dethrone Maya and enthrone Lord Krishna in our hearts. And here, in our hearts means in our minds. So let's look at the summary overview and then we're going to go back and uh, look at the shlokas. So from shlokas 1 to 10, the Lord teaches and establishes dharma. Dharma samsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. So let us look at shlokas 1 to 10 quickly. So we will quickly read um, shlokas 1 to 10, where the Lord is talking about dharma. <clears throat> so the personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna said, I instructed this imperishable science of yoga to the sun god Vivaswan, and Vivaswan instructed it to Manu, the father of mankind, and Manu in turn instructed it to Ikshvaku. So the supreme science was thus received through the chain of disciplic succession, and the saintly kings understood it that way. But in course of time, the succession was broken, and therefore the science as it is appears to be lost. That very ancient science of the relationship with the Supreme is today told by me to you because you are my devotee as well as my friend and can therefore understand the transcendental mystery of this science. Arjuna said, so remember the definition of the science is the relationship of the Supreme to the Jivatma. That's the transcendental mystery. Arjuna said, the sun god Vivaswan is senior by birth to you. How am I to understand that in the beginning you instructed this science to him? The personality of God had said, many, many births both you and I have passed. I can remember all of them, but you cannot, O subduer of the enemy. Although I am unborn and my transcendental body never deteriorates, and although I am the lord of all living entities, I still appear in every millennium in my original transcendental form. Whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious practices, O descendant of Bharata, and a predominant rise of irreligion, at that time I descend myself to deliver the pious and to annihilate the miscreants, as well as to re-establish the principles of religion. I myself appear millennium after millennium. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode, O Arjuna. 
being freed from attachment, fear, and anger, being fully absorbed in me, and taking refuge in me, many, many persons in the past became purified by knowledge of me, and thus they all attained transcendental love for me. So in the first 10 shlokas, what has the Lord established? What is actually dharma? Dharma is to understand that your position is servant of Krishna and that you're eternally part and parcel of Krishna. And that the Lord comes at a certain frequency to protect his devotees. So now in shlokas 11 to 15, Krishna is going to emphatically state he is the goal. Not only is he the goal, he is also the creator of all the paths that leads to him. So dharma involves various paths, but ultimately Krishna is the goal. But just because you take all other paths does not necessarily mean you reach Krishna. But at the same time, he is the creator of all those paths. So let's look, go back and look at 11 to 15. So it begins with the Lord saying, as all surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. Krishna doesn't say, as all surrender unto me, I give them Krishna prema. Your level of surrender depends the reward. As all surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects, O son of Britta. Men in this world desire success and fruit of activities and therefore they worship the demigods. Quickly, of course, men get results from fruit of work in this world. So now the Lord is going to briefly talk about the different ways in which he rewards them. So if you worship the demigods, how does he reward you? You get very quick results and that increases your faith. According to the three modes of material nature and the work associated with them, the four divisions of human society are created by me. And although I am the creator of the system, you should know that I am yet the non-doer being unchangeable. There is no work that affects me, nor do I aspire for the fruits of action. One who understands this truth about me also does not become entangled in the fruit of reactions of work. As we said, the mere knowledge that the Supreme Lord is the Supreme Lord wipes away your aprarabdha karma. But it is only when you offer yourself in service to the Lord that your prarabdha karma can be wiped out. All the liberated souls in ancient times acted with this understanding of my transcendental nature. Therefore, you should perform your duty following in their footsteps. Krishna is saying, don't just take my word for it. I'm telling you many, many great souls, they have understood that I am the Supreme Lord. And they've acted accordingly. And the, the Lord calls them liberated souls from ancient times. So the Lord is encouraging Arjuna to, by saying, others, great Acharyas have done this in the past. You should follow in their footsteps. So that's the second segment. So now from 16 to 24, we are going to look at Karma Yoga's Dharma because Arjuna is familiar with Karma Yoga. It's easy to follow. And that ultimately Karma Yoga will put you on the path of liberation as others have done in the past. And as others have done in the past, examples will come from Krishna. Even the intelligent are bewildered in determining what is action and what is inaction. Now I shall explain to you what action is, knowing which you shall be liberated from all misfortune. So in this small section, the Lord talks about karma, a karma and mi karma. A karma is working for Krishna. Karma is working for yourself. We karma is completely working against Krishna, going in the exact opposite direction. So the intricacies of action are very hard to understand. Therefore, one should know properly what action, what action is, what forbidden action is, and what inaction is. So action is karma here. Forbidden action is vi karma. Inaction is a karma, which is the same as working for Krishna. 
one who sees inaction and action and action and inaction is intelligent among men. And he is in the transcendental position, although engaged in all sorts of activities. One is understood to be in full knowledge whose every endeavor is devoid of desire for sense gratification. He is said by sages to be a worker for whom the reactions of work have been burned up by the fire of perfect knowledge. So the Lord uses a lot of burning up of your ignorance. The fire analogy is there quite frequently. So if you act without any sense gratification, there is no karmic reactions for you. Abandoning all attachment to the results of his activities, ever satisfied and independent, he performs no fruitive action, although engaged in all kinds of undertakings. So a self-realized soul may act just like you and me, but his activities are not mundane. Although to you it may look mundane, but to the Lord it is not. It is all on the transcendental platform. Such a man of understanding acts with mind and intelligence perfectly controlled, gives up all sense of proprietorship over his possessions and acts only for the bare necessities of life. So a person who's been given some possessions doesn't just reject the possessions, he keeps it and uses it in the service of Krishna. But he knows whatever has been given to him does not belong to him. It belongs to the Lord. So he knows who the original proprietor is. But nevertheless, the Lord says he acts only for the bare necessities of life. Thus working, he is not affected by sinful reactions. He who is satisfied with gain, which comes of its own accord, who is free from duality and does not envy, who is steady in both success and failure, is never entangled, although performing actions. The work of a man who is unattached to the modes of material nature and who is fully situated in transcendental knowledge merges entirely into transcendence. So <clears throat> a person who is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness is sure to attain the spiritual kingdom because of his full contribution to spiritual activities in which the consummation is absolute and that which is offered is of the same spiritual nature. You offer your entire Atma Nivedanam, everything, sum total of everything to Krishna. So, coming back. So, the last but one section is Shlokas 25 to 33, where the Lord talks about all the different kinds of sacrifices by which you can slowly make progress on this transcendental path. So, you can acquire this transcendental knowledge slowly through the process of various sacrifices. So, how do you get liberated by performing all these different kinds of yajnas? Essentially, achieving jnana through the process of sacrifice. So, karma yoga is one way to develop jnana. Similarly, there are other ways also to develop jnana. That is by performing yajna. So, that's 25 to 33. Some yogis perfectly worship the demigods by offering different sacrifices to them. And some offer sacrifices in the fire of the supreme Brahman. Some the unadulterated brahmacharis, sacrifice the hearing process and the senses in the fire of mental control. And others, the regulated householders, sacrifice the objects of the senses in the fire of the senses. You can go back and listen to the video on the shlokas that we covered so you understand exactly what is the Lord actually stating here. Because otherwise it all seems like a riddle a word riddle, a wordle. Others who are interested in achieving self-realization through the control of the mind and senses offer the functions of all the senses and of, life, of the life breath as oblations into the fire of the controlled mind. You see the fire of the senses, fire of the mind, fire of mental control. The Lord uses the word fire so often. Having accepted strict vows, some become enlightened by sacrificing their possessions. 
and others by performing severe austerities, by practicing the yoga of eightfold mysticism, or by studying the Vedas to advance in transcendental knowledge. So different types of yagnas can ultimately put you on the path of Krishna consciousness. Still others who are inclined to the process of breath restraint to remain in trance, practice by offering the movement of the outgoing breath into the incoming and the incoming breath into the outgoing and thus at last remain in trance, stopping all breathing. Samadhi. Others curtailing the eating process offer the outgoing breath into itself as a sacrifice. All these performers who know the meaning of sacrifice become cleansed of sinful reactions. So what's the first thing the Lord is saying? When you start performing all of these different types of yajnas, you start getting cleansed of your sinful reactions. And then having tasted the nectar of the results of sacrifice because you've experienced some success, they advance toward the supreme eternal atmosphere. The Lord is not saying they achieve the supreme atmosphere. They advance, which means they're making progress. Slowly, 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 slowly. Birth by birth by birth by birth. O best of the Kuru dynasty, without sacrifice, one can never live happily on this planet or in this life. What then of the next? So essentially, sacrifice is an essential element of our day-to-day -day life. We can never be separated from sacrifice. All these different types of sacrifice are approved by the Vedas. And all of them are born of different types of work. Knowing them as such, you will become liberated. O chastiser of the enemy, the sacrifice performed in knowledge is better than the mere sacrifice of material possessions. After all, O son of Pratha, all sacrifices of work culminate in transcendental knowledge. So if you're performing yajna, the Lord is saying, understand why you're performing it. Understand who it benefits. Understand who accepts that yajna. So performing yajnas with the knowledge of who is accepting that, that sacrifice from you, Krishna says is better than simply sacrificing things without knowing what you're doing. So that was still 33. So now 34 to 42. The glory of Divya Jnana, transcendental knowledge. Which of the ways should one follow? So the Lord has outlined so many different ways. So what part should we follow? So here the Lord talks about transcendental knowledge and um, the importance of a spiritual master. Just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master. Inquire from him submissively and render service unto him. The self-realized souls can impart knowledge unto you because they have seen the truth. Having obtained real knowledge from a self-realized soul, you will never fall again into such illusion. For by this knowledge you will see that all living beings are but part of the Supreme. Or in other words, that they are mine. Even if you are considered to be the most sinful of all sinners, when you are situated in the boat of transcendental knowledge, you will be able to cross over the ocean of miseries. As a blazing fire turns firewood to ashes, O Arjuna, so does the fire of knowledge burn to ashes all reactions to material activities. In this world, there is nothing so sublime and pure as transcendental knowledge. Such knowledge is the mature fruit of all mysticism. And one who has become accomplished in the practice of devotional service enjoys this knowledge within himself in due course of time. A faithful man who is dedicated to transcendental knowledge and who subdues his senses is eligible to achieve such knowledge. And having achieved it, he quickly attains the supreme spiritual peace. So eligibility criteria one is faith. But ignorant and faithless persons who doubt the revealed scriptures 
do not attain God consciousness, they fall down. For the doubting soul, there is happiness neither in this world nor in the next. One who acts in devotional service, renouncing the fruits of his actions, and whose doubts have been destroyed by transcendental knowledge, is situated factually in the self. Thus, he is not bound by the reactions of work, O conqueror of riches. Therefore, the doubts which have arisen in your heart out of ignorance should be slashed by the weapon of knowledge. Armed with yoga, O Bharata, stand and fight. So this is a summary view of this chapter where the Lord is encouraging Arjuna, now that I've explained this transcendental knowledge, the science of the soul and the super soul and the relationship between them and my position as a Supreme Lord, by understanding this, uh, you should stand up and fight. The first fight is win your inner battle, your inner doubts. The second fight is the actual fight on the battlefield. So Arjuna has to conquer his inner demons in order to succeed. So after he has conquered this, these inner demons through this transcendental knowledge, then he can conquer the enemy on the battlefield. So that is the essence of this entire chapter called Transcendental Knowledge. The supreme science of the soul in its constitutional position as a servant created to actually please the Supreme Lord.